Welcome, everybody, to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. And most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007, and I'm the author of Beyond Surviving, the final stage of recovery from sexual abuse. I work with survivors who are sick and tired of feeling broken and unfixable, and I help them let go of the pain of abuse and move on with their lives. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at rachelgrantcoaching.com. So tonight we are in for such a treat. I just don't even know if you guys even understand what you're in, in for tonight because we have the wonderful Angela Shelton with us. And she is going to be sharing with us her year-long healing course to help you move away from trauma in very fun ways. And so just to tell you a little bit about Angela, if you're not already aware, she is a filmmaker, screenwriter, author, actor, public speaker, and mom. She's amazing. And her first uh-huh. film, Tumbleweed, was based on her life with her mom. And in between writing jobs, she took to the road during the winter's the writer's strike to direct her first film and ended up creating the award-winning documentary, Searching for Angela Shelton, that really put a spotlight on sexual abuse and domestic violence. And this is actually how I first um, discovered Angela Shelton. I watched this documentary and was so blown away. It was uh, fundamental in my own journey of healing. And um, it's something that I share far and wide with all of my clients because it's such, um, it's just beautiful and uh, heart-wrenching and powerful. So if you have not checked that out, what are you waiting for? Go get it. And she's also appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show and Larry King Live and 48 Hours Investigate, NPR, Lifetime Television for Women, The Ricky Lake Show, and the cover of the New York Times. So we are especially honored to, to have her here with us at um, Beyond Surviving Radio. Her memoir, Finding Angela Shelton, is also used so often for women's studies programs, even to be mandatory reading for some of them. And so... Angela even won an Emmy as an actress for her role as Safe Side Super Chick, which also I love. I love Woo-hoo! that. If you guys ever need to laugh, yes. Woohoo! Right. Because this Safe Side video series um, created by Baby Einstein's creator, Julie Clark, oh my goodness, it is so, so important and so, so powerful and such a great resource um, for teaching children exactly what they need to know. Um, stay safe. And, um, and it's hilarious. On other movies. And it's hilarious. <laughs> so <laughs> she's working on, she's constantly working, you know, we were chatting before we got on the line, even in the midst of, you know, baby time and, you know, the baby's growing up. But she keeps moving. She's writing and doing things and constantly helping other survivors, just like herself, find healing, typically through her online course, HealingSpeakers.com. So, Angela, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. Yay, thank you. That was awesome. Yay. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. I need a nap. <laughs> I know. Are we done? We're done? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? You have done so much. My goodness, your journey, lady, is just, it's an inspiration. And I think it's a true testament to how we can come out of some really dire experiences and go on to live this rich, wonderful, fulfilling lives that we don't have to stay in the struggle. And, uh, you know, speaking of struggles, what did you go through, like being a survivor and working in Hollywood and really trying to get this story that a lot of people, I'm guessing, are like, hey, we're not, like, let's not go there. That's just, you know, that's territory we don't want to deal with. Um, what was that like for you? Oh, that's a good um haha. Well, in Hollywood that's so funny. If it if I had not done my documentary, I honestly think I would have probably married some ass and been like popping pills and <laughs> drinking myself silly and living in some cul de sac and wearing a robe and like screaming at people. <laughs> 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 I just 
sure, like, if I had not done that. There's, like, life before searching and then life after searching. Mm -hmm. And though it Mm -hmm. did, like, pause my whole world for 10 years and my career, it was really worth it because it really threw me into really my own healing because I was not planning on talking about this subject at all. I honestly just wanted to direct a movie. And I only wanted to do that because my a director, uh, who may or may not have been intimately involved with me at one point, um, had told me <laughs> that I was uh, too young and too female to direct. And I got like so effing my mm-hmm. um, just crazy when I like I saw red when I heard that, and I just was like, I'm directing a movie this summer. In fact, I'm leaving in 30 days. And I, and I raised the money and got a crew, and I was just like, I'm making a movie. I had no idea that that movie was going to turn out to be this little beautiful little piece of, I don't know, I, just, I love that movie. And it has a whole life of its own, as you know. It's completely, yeah. I'm more like blessed to have been a part of it, as opposed to, like, I don't really feel that that movie is mine if that makes sense. It's mm-hmm. not like, yeah, I mean, it's got my name on it, but it has nothing to do with me and it's everything about me and it changed my life. And But it's not really mine. It's the universe mm-hmm. like threw me into that. <laughs> so uh, yeah. being a survivor in Hollywood, um, it, to answer the question, I think, um, it saved my life. Had I stayed in Hollywood without healing, I probably, like I said, would be in a cul-de-sac, like popping pills, like looking crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Does that I get make so. sense? Yeah, well, Hollywood has a tendency to do that to people, right? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So so there was this real moment where, you know, somebody had the cojones to be like, well, you're just a girl, whatever. You're just a girl. You know, like, you know, I'm going to show you. And I think there's an interesting and beautiful parallel that a lot of us go through where it's like, you know, Yes, these things have happened to me, and yes, I'm a certain way, and yes, there are certain things about me, but at the end of the day, I am going to take some stuff on. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to see. I'm going to prove a lot of people wrong. And um, I love that it really kind of lit a fire under your ass and got you going, because my goodness, thank God, because what can be oh, yeah. the result of that is. 100%. And really nothing, ab- ab- oh, nothing okay. bad about cul-de-sacs, by the way. Nothing bad about cul-de-sacs. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. To our listeners currently in a call to sack, we love you too. Yeah, I'm expecting like an email. Like, I live in a call to sack. How dare you say that, man? Sorry. Right. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I had no idea that the um, the project was as um, as long span span as many years as you. There's mostly ten years you spent from the moment of oh, yeah. conception. Like, I'm gonna do a movie. I'm gonna start this to getting your crew together and then going through all the filming and the editing and the putting it all together for 10 years. Holy moly. It was a long time. Yeah. And so you decided, okay, it's going to be a movie. How did you find your way to, I want to tell this story of my abuse and my journey and my process and especially, you know, talking with family members and other women. How did you get there? Uh, well, anybody that makes a documentary will learn that uh, the documentary tells you what it is. You, you, if you go in like, this is how way it's going to be, you're going to be laughing at yourself. Like years later, you're like, mm-hmm. you're so funny. Ha, ha, ha. <clears throat> Honestly, the Angela Shelton's really essentially told me what the documentary was. I didn't want to be in the movie, which is funny. Yeah. I wanted to be like, I'll, I'm interviewing women around America. We just all happen to have the same name. I wanted to be like, how are you as a woman? Where have you been? Where are you going? And how do you feel about yourself? Mm-hmm. I kind of pictured it like the Virginia Slims ad. Like, you've come along, my right. baby. Let's, like, bond <laughs> together as women because we're all awesome. And in Hollywood, I've noticed that they're, they're really awful to each other. Not in every situation. There are really great women. But I notice like, they'll trip you, you know, as you're trying to walk in the door and punch you in the face. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I noticed that I got way more help by men than I did women. And I was like, why aren't the women like, where's our like bond? What's going on? So that was my ultimate goal. It's just when I started interviewing the Angelas and I just started seeing this Mm -hmm. through line, because that's what the movie was. I I don't, for those of people who haven't seen it, 
It's like, well, why? It's free on snagfilms.com. Go watch it for free. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my little plug for Snag Films. And um, so I, I drove around the country and I was interviewing every woman who had my name. That's where it all started. And when they started telling me their stories of their whole life story of like, oh, my God, incest, domestic violence, rape. They all mm-hmm. wanted to know, like, well, bitch, what is your story? I'm not telling you mine until you tell me yours. Mm-hmm. And then once oh. I was really, they actually never called me bitch. I'm just, I love them very much, <laughs> all of them. And so, <laughs> and when I, when I would tell them my, my cliff notes of my life, <clears throat> I'm like, oh, yeah, I grew up in kind of an abusive home. I was in foster care. I was taken out of there and finally went back to my mom. You know, I, I was, a you know, it was like child sexual abuse, whatever. And then I went to live with my mom, and then I made a movie about my mom's marriages called Tumbleweeds, and well, I co-wrote it. And um, and I wrote the book about that, blah, blah, blah. I, I just, like, I just kind of touched the issue of, like, child sexual right. abuse and foster yeah. care and stuff like that. I, I moved on. I was like, oh, and then I did this, 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 and oh, my God, I'm like, on this TV show. And they're like, wait a minute, what would you say about that past? And... I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. I have a therapist, <laughs> and you know, and you know, it was just this one little moment in my life, blah blah blah. And then they started sharing me, sharing their stories with me, and then that opened up the can of worms. And then, as an artist and filmmaker, I'm like, wait a second, what's the through line of this film? As I'm traveling around talking to this woman, oh crap, the through line really is. Well, when you see the film, the the narration, if you will, is me talking to the anonymous Angela Shelton, who never appears. Her name is obviously Angela Shelton, but you never see her, so she's called anonymous. And really, I was talking to myself. Because, I mean, yes, she had her own issues, and it was alcoholism and self-abuse and all kinds of other things. But her self-hatred mingled, so mirrored mine perfectly. And I was, like, talking to myself. I'm like, wait, why aren't you doing all these things in your life? As I'm asking her these questions, I turn around. I'm like, oh wait, I'm asking myself these questions. Oh crap! Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, why don't you you uh, you know confront your demons? And then, you know, here I run into an Angela Shelton who lives in the same town as my father, who's a child molester, and it's Father's Day, and I'm talking to myself. Hello, why don't you con- you know confront your demons? So as an mm-hmm. as an artist, I was like, this is brilliant. You can't write this. There's like a term. <laughs> It's lightning in a bottle. It's oh, like yeah. lightning in a oh, bottle. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God, you just fell on all these amazing things. But as a, as a, a female and a, a human, a survivor, I was like, oh, shit. Like, you know, like, I don't want yeah. oh, to do yeah, this much less on film. And then you know what the I, artist one. Oh, go ahead. The artist one. Yeah, and thank God. And you know what? I, what really stands out to me and it's so beautiful about that is this moment of we do a lot of great brilliant work to avoid and dismiss or hide out from what our experiences have been right and i think we all have a moment where it gets brought to the to the forefront and it's like okay it's like put up or shut up it's time to deal with it or keep living a certain way and it's so beautiful that it was through this journey of talking to other women that you were able to kind of come into that place of like, oh, like this is for me and it's my time to, to heal and to take a look at these, um, these things. And certainly, you know, it was, it's all, it still surprises me, of course, how many women are out there and then to, to go through this experience. And to have had the opportunity to, to gather those stories and to give those women a platform to share um, what they went through is very, very beautiful. And certainly, you can see in the film those moments where you're, like, kind of shocked that you're having to do some of this. <laughs> like, holy yeah. shit. Like, this is not on the script. <laughs> and not planned at all. But it's... At the end of the day, it was such a moment of freedom. And I love the part of the reason why I really share this film with people is like, look, it is scary as shit to look at the beginning. You know, they are gonna everything in you is gonna wanna just skip it, like you said. Like whatever, whatever, it's just no big deal. Let's go on to talking about me or what I'm doing today. But yeah. the most brilliant thing, you know, that you illustrate is that 
when we stand and we take a look, that on the other side of that is some really beautiful healing. And I know that that's been a part of it, but I know there must be other things. So I, I'm really curious about what you have found to be of most help to you in your own healing journey. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, the film I did so long ago, it's now, what, mm-hmm. 14 years? And still I'm talking about it. I mean, well, other people are talking about it and having me on their show. <laughs> but I'm like, that yes. film I did it so long ago. It, it, <clears throat> and people will run into me and say, like, oh, my God, you made that film, and I, it changed my life. And, oh, my God, how are you? Are you okay? I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm living a totally different life. I'm in a totally different universe compared to that film. But the power of it is all about the conversation because it is all about breaking the silence. I mean, that's that term is so overused, but it's so true. It's like I'm yeah. just literally breaking the silence. And so for, for me, the film, the process of that was the first catalyst. And then I literally mm-hmm. learned five, I mean, I hate to say it, like five easy steps. Yeah. Yeah, and, but right. it is actually true. I literally learned like five easy steps because what happened is after I finished, I went on the road and for years I was traveling and speaking, but I was healing as I was sharing the film. Like I wasn't, I was still mm-hmm. like a live wire of emotion and like, you know, stripped just a lot, like live wire emotions right on my sleeve, heart on my sleeve. And so <clears throat> the, what I learned, the first thing that was most important for me in my healing was to acknowledge that I had a problem. That's like number one. Well, I mean, that's like in 12 steps is that that's a huge thing too, of like acknowledging, oh, you have a problem. And that's a lot easier said than done. And for me, it was all the whole self-hatred stuff and like keeping myself back and afraid to step up, afraid to fight for myself, afraid to like get in the person's face who told me I couldn't direct because I was too young and too female. Now, I probably would be like, yo, motherfucker. You know what I mean? <laughs> but before, right. I was like, well, maybe he's right. And I'll I'll prove myself by going to uh, make a film. But I would never stand up in his face and say that because I would be like, oh, mm. shuddering. Like, oh, I, you, you know? Now, I think mm-hmm. I would be like, yo, listen, you get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> also, I've had a child. <laughs> So that totally changes everything oh, yeah. too. When you know something yeah. comes out of your body, um, and this is the second one was I really saw on the stage once. I was like I had this vision because I work like really visually as an artist, and I had this vision of all this stuff that we talk about and all this repeated trauma and all this pain and all these other speakers that I would see. Not not shunning other speakers because everybody has their process, but a lot of times hearing other hearing like. The, the subject is so freaking depressing. You hear like, we're going to talk about trauma right. and recovery. And then we're all going to drive our car off a cliff. And here's some <laughs> razors and let's just all kill ourselves because it's so fucking depressing. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And like, oh, and yeah. you're just like, God, there's no fun here. And I literally was yeah. on stage talking and I had this vision that I'm like, oh my God, it's like I have a sword stuck in my body. Like literally a sword, which sum it up like, okay, Picture you have an actual sword stuck in your body, and I'm talking like you know, picture that King Arthur type sword. You know, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's hard to breathe. You can't move very well. You certainly can't have a good sex life. You you know you can't hug anybody. You know what I mean? Like you can't become oh, yeah. intimate. It hurt. It hurt. It, there's so that like summed it up for me in so many ways. The visual of that, I'm like, oh my god, that's how I've been living my life. Like a sword in my body. Holy Mm -hmm. mother of God. Well, how do I take it out? And that's like the third thing, which would be like removing the sword. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, actually, I'm I'm losing myself. I had a baby. I have all kinds of excuses in the world. (laughs) So like acknowledging it and then acknowledging the sword and then removing the sword is the two. You got to have the five steps, you know. Um, the, the, removing it, and for, for me, I traveled around as I was speaking, and I tried every possible way to remove the sword, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, I learned, even watching other people who were successful at it, who had lived on and like, or like le- leading lives that I wanted to emulate, or like, I'm like, wow, you really seem together. Is it true? Are you lying? Are you secretly like 
or smoking heroin. Right, that's that. <laughs> Are you like truthfully okay? And, and, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I saw the two things that were most intense with people were you a fear of crying or a fear of touching your anger, which was me. I would cry like I could cry anything. I'd cry telling you about you know whatever. I can cry talking about a dog food commercial. But touch my mm-hmm. anger and actually, like, stand up for myself and really, like, go toe-to-toe and really, like, fight for myself. I never did that. I was like, what? I can't do that. No, 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 no. I'll go cry. And I noticed, like, a lot of people that – and then you meet the really super tough people that, like, that that's not a problem for them at all. They're always in your face. They're, like, the ones that, like, you talk, talk about my story. I'll cut you. I'll cut you. You know? Those are the ones that mm-hmm. can't cry. They're so afraid of it. So for me, what I saw was like removing the sword, metaphorically, had so much connection to your anger and your rage and your tears. Mm-hmm. And you got to do both of it. If they go hand in hand, like yeah. once you touch the anger and rage, you're probably going to cry. And once you touch the crying and you're like purge the crying, then you're like, Ma, I want to attack a, <laughs> a punching bag. About this. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and then the and then as far as like okay once you remove it and once you do the crying and the the rage which I mean there's tons of techniques with to you know to help you do that I'm sure you've found many I and mean, that's a whole other show mm-hmm. right, you know yeah. but yeah. the the next thing was remo- was healing the wound so it's like okay you removed it I've talked about it I've purged it I connected to my anger I ruined quite a few punching bags. Now I have this wound left from the sword. How do I heal the wound? I mean, yeah, okay, you'll have a really great scar. You can tell great stories, but you don't want to just be Mm -hmm. bleeding profusely. And like, okay, because I see a lot of people, a lot of people, I'm sure you've seen this too, like their story becomes their life. Uh And granted, you know what I'm saying? Where it's like you're bleeding it all the time. Like it's like, oh God, enough already. Like for me, it's like, I would tell my story because I'm I'm doing it, you know, because I'm speaking and I'm 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 telling it as a as an example, but no right. longer telling it like <laughs> oh God I'm gonna tell and I want From you know I have, mm-hmm. yeah the victimhood like you're re-victimizing yourself over and over and over, mm-hmm. and I've seen yeah. how a lot of people you get like stuck on on the hamster wheel like you're like oh crap yeah. I'm stuck here and I don't know what how to get off this hamster wheel and that goes back to acknowledging it like hey going to acknowledging your sword like oh yeah you're stuck on a hamster wheel and your victim story mm-hmm. and then let's remove it and then heal the wounds and then on my travels i discovered so many different healing techniques like i did everything i traveled everywhere i went to you know the life vessel in santa fe which is one of the most incredible places ever called the life vessel and I sat in like a light and sound therapy box and you know I did uh yeah. the dance meditations and like you name it like everything mm-hmm. everything crystals mm-hmm. like I'm I am my mother's daughter so I you know like essential oils like everything <laughs> including obviously talk therapy and whatever whatever what I never did was any um drugs I never took any um uh psychiatry drugs because I was just mm-hmm. super anti that I was like I don't not that you know it's not, it works for some people, it helps you over the hump, but I um I never did that. I tried all kinds of things, and the most powerful things I found were all free, and I spent a lot mm-hmm. of money on healing techniques. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like oh, you go to whatever the goddess retreat that's eight hundred dollars. It's in the woods, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Right. It's like everything right. <laughs> was. I'm not saying that it's not bad. It's awesome. It's great. But it's like the most thing, valuable things I learned were free that you do inside your head. Mm-hmm. And right. I share them easily. Right. I mean, I share them on my website and everything. Like, hey, here's a free thing. Do this when you're driving and see if it works because it will. And then, you know, you heal the wound and you have all of a sudden like, oh, wait, I have that sword, a.k.a. your story or that experience. Mm-hmm. It's more like life experience. And so right. from the visual for me that works so well, like as the – visual artist that I am I'm like oh my god then you have the sword it's like you have this life experience you can't pick it up when you're wounded you need to heal those wounds so that you're strong enough to pick up this like King Arthur sword 
or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's the Kill Bill sword, or whatever sword you know, <laughs> you want. <laughs> but it's like for me, I had like a, a King Arthur like knight shining armor, whatever sword, and that becomes like your life experience. And I was like, how do you mm-hmm. use that? Like use it to like, okay, well I. I now cut away all kinds of negative thought patterns or like I stand up for myself Mm -hmm. or whatever. There's tons of ways you can quote unquote use your sword. And then my favorite thing that I got to was like, okay, then also I don't want to always be doing that. I don't want to always be like, I have a sword at my hip. Like I have an experience. I have life experience. (laughs) I'll I'll cut you. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, geez, I don't even want to be carrying this thing around, you know? I'm a full whole human and I have experience and yeah, I can use that sword. I can whip your ass, but I'm fine standing on my own. What do you do now? And I'm like, Oh, you play. That was the biggest thing for me. It was like, Oh my God, you reclaim playtime, which goes back kind of to the sword. And you go back to like, Oh, let's go to target and get like the, the fake swords and let's have a fun (laughs) sword fight. And play, because how many times has anybody gone through all this crap? And I say crap because it doesn't matter whether it's child sexual abuse or rape or domestic violence or neglect or blah, blah, blah. I don't even want to hear your story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't mean that as a disrespectful way. It's just like, just put it in the bucket. Don't even worry about it. Just put it in the bucket and come over here. Let's purge. Let's cry. Let's rage. And then let's freaking play. Like, why are we playing? Nobody talks about that. Well, actually, that's not true because we're talking about it right now. La, la, la. It's like (laughs) reclaiming, (laughs) reclaiming playtime. Because how many people who have been through crap never got to play? Like, I'm working Mm -hmm. on my next project right now is about a a male survivor. I guarantee you he never had any play in his life. None. He had violence. And it's like... You know, so it's like, uh, and and it's just like I bring that up because it's like, oh my god, you're like, oh my god, you're making another movie about abuse. No, <laughs> it's a love story. <laughs> it's just the, the subplot, like, like the under. Yeah. yeah, you're like, oh god, dang. <laughs> it, the sad thing is, it's like you go to the underneath place. You like the, like write this beautiful um, love story that has like a tragic, a, a tragic, hugely tragic element to it. And it's like you dive underneath and you dive further underneath, and there it is, the it abuse is. of childhood, or yeah, you know the violent. You know, you're looking for it, it's just there. It's right there, Everywhere. and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. and yeah. and there was no play. No playtime. So I think we as humans, having been through crap, because everybody has their crap. I mean, you go through people dying. Like how many friends and loved ones have I seen die in the past two years? It's like crazy. So whatever you're going through, it's like we forget to play. This is a beautiful thing. Having a child is now crawling. She's reminding me Mm -hmm. every day to play. Yes. Because, like, I'm on my knees with her, and I'm like, la, la, la. I'm, like, banging, like making up songs about everything. So she's, like, a really great <laughs> reminder to play. But it's like, okay, if all of us who've been through all this crap, like, reclaim the playtime, imagine the, what you can do then, collectively, yeah. yourself, creatively, oh my God. having a great sex life. Hello. You t- how about right. you talk about that? You know what I mean? That that goes right into play because hopefully you're playing. Mm-hmm. If it's not play, then what? Get out of bed. Go take a shower. <laughs> 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 like, it's like play time, but you, but but it having come from where we've come from, like you have to go through the other steps. Yeah. That's why it's like I know I hate that. That now blogs are always like the five steps, the ten steps, the nine steps. But it's like it really is like the five little steps I discovered. Of okay, yeah. I saw it as a sword, and then remove the sword, heal the wound, then learn to use it, and then forget the sword, and play, yeah. go reclaim yeah. playtime. Yeah, awesome. and I think that would make a world yeah, a better place. And that's my answer in I, the end. Yeah, well, <laughs> good, good answer, good answer. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want to I want to go back to a few of these and dig around in them a little bit because I I think that first of all it's absolutely true that there is a process and a journey 
And um, and when we have kind of a, a way of thinking about from this step to that step to this step, I think it helps because in my own experience, part of what got crazy about the healing was it felt like there was no direct path. And it was, you know, we know what to do when somebody breaks their arm, right? You do this, this, and this. And for whatever reason, there was this mentality that the same wouldn't apply to healing from abuse or crap. But there really is. I mean, once you kind of notice, if you do this and this and this, you get the same outcome every single time, regardless of what the thing is that you're dealing with. And I absolutely um, love this this process that you're outlining for us of starting out with acknowledgement, really seeing what it is and naming it, calling a you know a spade a spade. And this is what happened to me. And I'm not going to keep denying it. I'm not going to keep dismissing it or ignoring it or pretending it's not there. And shit, yeah, that's scary. It's scary to realize you've got this sword, you know, stuck in your body. <laughs> but oh yeah, I love this analogy that you're like walking <clears throat> around. I mean, it's such a good visual because we, how many of us walk around for years of our lives with this thing? sticking out of us and it's knocking people over and it's keeping us from doing things and we keep going, well, I don't know what the problem is. Well, there's a damn sword. (laughs) Uh, It adds to more trauma too. It does. It does. And as soon as you name it, as soon as you get to that place and that thing where you can just name it, my goodness, then you can do something about it. It is exactly what you're saying. Like look at the sword and then you can remove it. And I think it's really beautiful that, you know, yes, there are a lot of different ways that you can remove that sword. And everybody, you know, you find the way that works for you. For some people, it's going to be this. For some people, it's going to be that. And then once you've got it out of your way, healing it is so is so crucial. And, but I really love that you highlighted that at this stage of healing the wound, because I agree with you, and I do see this in a lot of people that I've come across, and I think I've even lived in that space where I'm just going to be the wounded kid. Oh, I was abused as a kid, and that'll just be my excuse for everything. And uh, I'm just going to keep being in this pain, and it's always just going to be that way. They walk around wounded all the time. And it's, uh, it's, it is quite a phenomenon. And one of the things that I've discovered in my own journey and in my research is that there is more than just the fact that you miss out on getting to have your life and play, um, as we're talking about, you actually, on a neurological level, are doing some major damage. Because yeah, the more you reiterate, totally. the more you revisit, you're just making those thoughts and beliefs stronger and stronger and stronger. And so, you know, you're becoming more and more and more your past and your story and your pain instead of healing from it. Yeah, so we have to have that moment where we're ready to set it down and say, you know, enough of that. It's time to move on. And how can I use this for others um, when it comes time? But I also don't have to become this person who every day is just about that. I can go out and play. And, man, Angela, I have to say, when you were sharing that part, it really brought back to me this moment when I went, I, you know, the abuse had started and I went to my friend's house and, you know, every day up until that day, we had like, gone over there and we played dolls and we goofed off, you know, and just had a, uh, you know, I was, a, you know, kind of a, a juicy kid. Well, I still am a juicy person. So always been juicy. But that day I was like, I don't want to play with you. I don't want to play. There are other things that go on in life. Like there was this real moment of, I don't get to be a kid anymore because I've got this problem that I don't know what to do about. And I, mm. I think that you are hitting on something so, so important that you're right. We don't necessarily give enough attention to it, that we lose. We don't lose, but we certainly disconnect from that sense of play. And the biggest... And you know what? i got to jump in here. For, yeah, please I just had please. a vision of... Um, something because there's not much time to deal with this Mm -hmm. it's like I'm dealing with I'm visiting my mom right now she had a she's in the hospital I won't go into details but there's a lady on the wing of the hospital uh, this for physical rehab that is oh I don't know 70s 80s and all day she goes mama help me 
help me, mama, help me, mama, help me. And I can, of course, I go into the whole like, oh, God, I wonder where that's coming from. That's probably coming from the abuse and it's coming back and she had never dealt with it and she's older and it's coming back. And it's like, you know what? I've had so many friends of mine die and loved ones die in the past two years. It's like we don't have much time. It's like, you, do you want to be sitting in a wheelchair hunched over going, Mama, help me, Mama, help me, help me, Mama? Because you never, as my friend Andy says, lay it on the table. Like, just lay it mm-hmm. on the table and let's deal with it. And, yeah, it hurts. It hurts. And, okay, it's going to hurt for what? I spent three hardcore years, like three years of my life, hardcore, like 20, like that was my, that was my job was to get better. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying, mm-hmm. like, it's three years or whatever. There's no, like, official time <clears throat> Frame yeah. for anybody but I'm just saying like yeah. put it on the table and really work on yeah. it and then you deal with it and now it's like it's not part of my life anymore I don't think about it unless until right. you called me and and said right. you know will you please do the <laughs> you know what I mean I'm like oh okay I'll tell that story you know but yeah. but yeah. I'm not that my future is not going to be in a hallway going mama help me mama help me you know what I'm saying exactly. and it's like it, when I hear yeah. when I hear that like really getting stuck in the wound that could be future, and it's like, are you going to let whatever motherfucker, I totally just said that word, mm-hmm. um, okay. who abused you or wh- whoever or, or whatever group of them or whoever it was, own so much of your power that you're going to ruin your freaking life, and at the end, like, okay, however older you are, you know, look at 80-year-old lady right there, and it just breaks my heart, yeah. and I'm like, I'm just like, damn it. Like, I wish that, yeah. like, in her 20s or Fifteen, or you know, and it's granted, it's never yeah. too late. My mom did a healing mm-hmm. at sixty-eight, so yeah. so I just had to throw that yeah. out there. Well, my oldest like, client is seventy-one. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. See, that's awesome. Yeah. So I just had to yeah. throw that out there because it's happened recently, but and I, I just thought about that whole thing. Like, oh, mama, no, help me. It's really true because this is. I actually had a very similar experience when I was um, in the hospital when I was a teenager. Uh, I was actually there because I had tried to kill myself, and the nurse oh. came in, but I thought the nurse was more broken than me. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh-huh. And it was this moment of like, oh my gosh, I <clears throat> have to try to figure this out sometime, somewhere, because I exactly like you're saying, like, I do not want to find myself at 50, 60 going, my life is still, and, and look, what's really wonderful and amazing about the, the era that we're living in is that we have such the opportunity and so many resources. A lot of my clients are in their 50s and 60s, and they're only just now dealing with it because their generation didn't have the support and the encouragement to look at it and to do something about it. You know, and so I feel a lot of grace for them. But then there are also people who, you know, as give them every single tool you could ever give them, and they'll still be like, no, never mind, I can't do it. Don't want to handle it. Don't want to deal with it. And that is heartbreaking because you're so right. It actually doesn't. This is one of my missions is this bullshit that's out there that this is a lifelong sentence. You're always going to have to deal with it. It's always going to be a thing. I am so done with that rhetoric. And oh, yeah. feeling like it has taken them forever to heal. It doesn't take that long. It doesn't have to take forever. It just, you just have to start. If you have to start, it is going to take forever if you don't start. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. <laughs> you know, yeah. So thank you for reminding us of the preciousness of life and that we don't have to spend all the rest of our years being defined and thinking and seeing the world and ourselves through the lens of our abusers. So true. Well and, said. Yeah. And also, it's like I so see a lot as far as what's that? Go ahead. Oh, as far as that whole. Um, topic just one last thing it's like holding on to that story because if you let it go you have nothing and sometimes that nothingness is so scary but it's like oh my god wait if i stop that story or if i stop that this is what i'm bringing back that topic you know if i stop that kind of like attachment to the wounds and holding on to this the quote-unquote story what do i do well do nothing It's like it goes back yeah. to the playtime. It's a blank canvas. Sometimes people are so scared exactly. of a blank canvas. Don't do anything. Yeah. Just sit yeah. there and look at it. Yeah. Like I'm I, I'm a oh my main, 
my main thing is is writing. Like I do many things, but my number one main thing is writing. And I have this term like, okay, I'll I'll get a story or I'll think about a story. I'll have an idea or I'll get a producer meeting and notes on a script or whatever. And I can't do it right then in the meeting. I I say, okay, I gotta go. Let me go look at a wall. Let me go stare at a wall. And I literally like it's it's usually the ceiling. <laughs> The same, it's <laughs> but it's like I have a. It's like I gotta just stare at a wall. I just gotta stare at a blank wall and just like just clear the my brain, clear the brain. Mm-hmm. And that's also like that fear of if I let go of the story of like do nothing, stare at a wall. Mm-hmm. And you'll be amazed yeah. at having like oh you get oh I have the clarity or I have this idea or I just wrote a song. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, cause, because, you know, one of the things that I thought that you um, really highlighted beautifully is that getting back to the state of just being and not always in a state of being, which is so much about what play is about. When you watch children, they aren't trying to do or accomplish anything, really. They're just being. That's and they're true. they're following their instincts, and they're just, you know, seeing Except what knocking everything down. What, <laughs> well, right, but what happens if I knock everything down? Oh, this happens? Okay, well, whatever, let's go on, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're not saved by anything. You know, they just let me throw the blocks everywhere and see what happens. And and they are really good at just kicking back and taking things in and looking and seeing and not trying to do anything. And so I love that as a, a metaphor for, for us because – we can get trapped in that, I've got to fix this, I've got to fix this, I've got to fix it, I've got to do something about it. Um, and sometimes we even just need a reprieve from recovery. <laughs> right? It's like, wow, uh, yeah. take a break, just, just, you know, chill out for a minute. And, you know, one of the things that my, my clients are often pretty surprised by is how much we laugh, you know, in our sessions. And it, it's true. Like, you know, this journey doesn't have to be this gut-wrenching, horrible, painful thing, there are going to be those moments, but there's plenty of room for, for light and, um, and freedom in there. So how do you play these days? Uh, on the, on my knees with my kid who's crawling. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's like the, the champion of the play, so she, she she's the leader. Right now, (laughs) but um, as far as other creative play, I really one of my favorite things in the world to do is write songs, and I haven't done it in Mm -hmm. years. And I did it for this one band years ago in L.A., who I just reconnected with him because of another death of a friend. Unbelievable. And uh, I said, "Wow, writing songs that was my favorite thing to do. That's my most fulfilling writing I ever did." And he said, "Why aren't you doing it?" I'm like. Wow. Uh, la la la. So, so, <laughs> la la la. Okay, fine. And so today I was actually driving, and I've like I have to go to go with these long drives now to visit my mom. And I, I was writing a song. I wrote a song today. Mm-hmm. So and no, I'm not going to sing it because I just write the lyrics. I don't. Oh, like, no. No, I, I, no, we're not there yet, <laughs> yeah. people. Blah blah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> But we'll follow so up. We'll have that's... a follow up call. We'll have a sing along uh, yeah. show. Oh no! <laughs> so like, uh, so creatively, c- creative play mm-hmm. is important to me because then it keeps me yeah. uh, okay. If I don't create and if I'm not writing something, I get kind of cranky. It's kind of like if I didn't eat, mm-hmm. I get right. like irritable. Right. Um, so my that's kid good. playing with my kid and writing, creating is how I play. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the um, HealingSpeakers.com. What are people going to find when they go and check that out? Oh, Healing Speakers. The reason it's called Healing Speakers is once you heal. I I have healing survivors and sort of trauma and all this stuff too, but Healing Speakers was once you have uh, worked on it and gone through your healing, you then speak healing to other people, mm-hmm. whether you know it or not, mm-hmm. just by living your life, like you're yeah. emitting like this energy, you change the energy around you. And so what I did is I, I had a film studio set up and a green screen, and and I made a whole year long course of these little videos. Uh, that's my speaking engagements and my workshops. I kind of put them of uh, once a week for an entire year that I'm basically, I'm with you on your laptop or your computer or whatever. Um, And I take you through these steps. 
So there's it's definitely mm-hmm. homework. with a lot of homework. So it's okay. definitely not okay. like and I and I made it really reasonable fee and then that way I don't have to travel as much because I wanted to be a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. And I I mean obviously right. I still write and we make movies and so but I she's on my hip the whole time. Yeah. Um, that would be funny if I do a speaking engagement with my sword the next time because I usually come out with a sword if I have her on my hip and I'm like, yo, motherfucker. I'm like, stop, Raven. Get the fuck <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> it, it'll probably transform my speaking event. But anyway, I, I so there was, <laughs> there was like a whole many reasons I did this. I put this whole year-long program together. One is so I can stay at home. B, uh, uh, the two B, <laughs> but, um, is I got the request so many times of like, oh hey, can you make this to where you, can you come speak or can you send me a video? Can you do another YouTube video? And I was like, actually, why don't I just do it and you have access to it whenever? That if I'm not around, if I'm like giving birth, I'll because uh, I'd like to do it again. And so because it was really an awesome, I, I made I made good kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um so this way I am able to basically like share well not basically I, I do I share the whole year long program and you sign up and you get in there it's like $59 forever and then you are in there and you can have it whenever you want which I thought that was pretty mm-hmm. reasonable and yeah. um yeah, because I, I have to, that was, again, standing up for yourself. You have to get paid because it's like this whole, like, I'm going to do it for free. Yeah. And I'm going to starve and I'm going to lose my house and my car, you know, which I've also yeah. been there. I've been there on that road, too, until I learned. Rosie O'Donnell told me that. She gave me a huge lecture once about taking care of yourself, and I didn't listen to her at all. It took me years, and then I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you told me that, you didn't you? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, what did Rosie say? And then she's like, yeah, I told you. I'm like, uh. And I've told other people, and they won't listen until you fall flat on your face. And then you're like, oh, yeah, wait. So that's why I was like, I came up with a reasonable fee. And then it's a year-long program that you can go back and redo every year. And, and I've had so many great testimonials um, from it with people doing it. And it's just, it's been really fulfilling and so great. And my, actually my favorite is this woman uh, who took it in Brazil. Uh, I think she's starting the year over now. Um, she would really email me. She's like, Oh my God, these videos are so much fun. You're like the Mr. Rogers of healing. <laughs> I was, I like literally, I was like, I have to put that like on my like computer. Cause I was like, if I could do like the safe, sad, super chick, it's funny that I book Safe Sex Super Chick because that is me, totally, my personality in that show. Yeah, it's and, so, uh-huh. and that's also the videos. They're very funny and very fun because mm-hmm. we're talking, even mm-hmm. though we're talking about heavy stuff. But I break it down mm-hmm. of like, okay, you know, now is let's get yeah. real. Guess what? You're going to have to cry all day. That's your homework. Go. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's okay. Because so. it, <laughs> you're going to come back next week or tomorrow and we're going to laugh about something. But right now we have to cry. Let's go. Come on. So really, it's really uh, been I love that. really helpful. And um, mm. it was a lot of work. Oh my God. I worked so hard to put that thing together. Okay. And oh it's, yeah. it's a lot. Of, and I, another thing I do is I, di- I didn't want it automated like it's so it's not like a machine so when you sign up for it you literally get me and sometimes I'm like I'm like in the car not driving because I don't text and drive I pull over um uh, but I'll <laughs> see like I'm in I'm you know at a doctor's appointment or I'm you know at a swim class with my kid I'll be back to my laptop in 25 minutes you know and I set up each yeah. account with their own yeah. personal fun yeah. little password and that way you know that you get me and if you ever have a problem you're like it's real you know, it's me. It's not yeah. some like, and and it's yeah, that makes it more out, work. But who cares? You. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's like well, it's sometimes it feels so no, impersonal. You know, um, <laughs> you certainly have no fear of hard work because, lady, I have to tell you, you have such a um, such a uh, library of resources and tools and that are available and. People, you guys really need to go and check out everything that Angela has to offer. So you can go to AngelaShelton.com. You can go to HealingSpeakers.com. You can go, what was the website you said where your movie assisted? 
Oh, my. Oh, snag films. Snag films like and snag, check out searching yeah, for snag Angela films. Shelton. Yeah, they have a lot of documentaries and films for free and searchings on there. I love them. They're really nice. Okay. They're nice yeah, people. I like that, businesses that are nice people. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, definitely her TED Talk. I love Dish. That's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, so there, there's just no end to what you can um, learn from like, oh, Angela. Yeah, that's a so, good one. <laughs> no, that's a good I really, you know what, you should really life. just. Um, I did that too. Yeah, that was good. Um, the uh, really, my website is great to sign up because then I let everybody know about every new movie and stuff because I'm doing all kinds of other things. Right, right. I'm yeah, I can't wait to hear the music then. and the new film that you're working on. Um, absolutely. So, um, any final thoughts that you'd like to share tonight? Any final words that you'd like to to give to our listeners this evening? Oh, just that I like to stare at your blank slate uh, in your blank canvas and, you know, get rid of, like, drop it all. Put it all in the bucket at the door and stare Mm -hmm. at your blank canvas and see what, you know, what comes to mind. And also, you, Rachel, have such a great voice. You have the cutest little awesomest voice. It's so great. Yeah, I'm like listening to you like as if I was listening to your show. I'm like, oh, you're so like soothing and you have the greatest little voice. I'm like, oh, I love her. <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. Like you, as the host of the show, you probably don't usually get like, hey, and what about you? Um, but you're uh, you're really good and you're doing a great thing and you have the sweetest little voice. There, I said it. Man, well, that is a super treasure. That's going in my treasure chest right now. <laughs> that's good. That's super cool. And I have the biggest smile on my face, if you can see it, <laughs> and a little tear because, wow, thank you. I really appreciate that, Angela. And, I mean, she, she teased me a little bit, guys, because I've been, been on her for a little bit to, to get in here, but I just knew. I was like, I have got to connect, and I've got to share you. Uh, if people happen to not I know, know you got you. me like in the middle of like with puke in you my right hair in and so a, much. A <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I have puke in my hair. My kid just pooped all over me. But yeah, I'll do your show, sure. Yeah, yeah. You you're such a sweetheart to to have done it and, and, and found and found the time and made the time for us tonight. And I just know, gosh, what you have shared tonight is so powerful and so enriching and um, I wish you more love and all the best in everything. And, of course, we'll just be in touch and stay in touch. But if you guys have any questions, need any support, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, as Angela has made very obvious, she's, she's accessible and here for you guys. So um, her healing course, go over and check it out. And it could be just the thing to help you in that process of acknowledging and removing and healing and getting back to play. And I also uh, want to welcome you to visit uh, me over at rachelgrantcoaching.com and check out the resources that are there, um, including the blog and the podcast. And also, speaking of anger, this is something that Angela mentioned, is that this is one of the emotions that we have to kind of deal with and, and take on in our healing. Um, tomorrow night, I'll be doing a tele seminar with my pal Ingrid Caswell, all about anger and aggression and rage. And so, yeah. if you're uh, ready to get angry and get, go for it, then I really encourage you to come over and uh, join us for that. And you can go to rachelgrantcoaching.com/anger to sign up uh, for that. It's happening tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific and 9 p.m. Eastern. And um, You can always come back here the second Tuesday of each month to join us for Beyond Surviving Radio and also check out Susan Jacoby's Conversations That Heal every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. So, my lady, I think that's a wrap, unless you have anything else that you're dying to say. (laughs) It's perfect. And my kid is downstairs. I can hear her. She just started crying. And no, she's not alone. She's just like a team of people. (laughs) I have like a, a village. Yeah. I'm like bring in the village. Nice. So, <laughs> well, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Angela. It's been a real 
real beautiful time with you. I've had such a, a lovely evening getting to, to talk with you and hear and learn from you. And uh, thank you again so much. And have a good rest of your evening. And to everyone, uh, until next time, take very good care of you. Love you all. Good night. Aww, thanks. Good night.